Okay, you're welcome along. I am delighted to welcome Marty Clark back to the show. He is, of course, an all-star, a former down footballer, a former AFL footballer with Collingwood and involved with the down under 20 setup this year as well. Marty Clark, how are you getting on? You're very welcome. Thanks very much. Yeah, delighted to be on. Uh, everything's good with me in the mornings here. So uh, thanks for the invite. No, great to have you. We might start with what I mentioned there, being involved with the 20s this year. A really exciting backroom team, actually, that you guys had had lined up and down this year and also a really successful summer, as it turned out. Yeah, it was a brilliant um, sort of project to get involved in. Connor Lavery, he's obviously, um, you know, a very smart footballer, but he's a, he's a magnificent coach as well, a great passion for down football. So when I got the call from, from Connor that he... Um, was putting forward a team for the for the down under twenties. I was uh, delighted to be asked. Um, I kind of uh, you know enjoyed working with them, bits and pieces here and there. So um, to to get involved with your own county um, at any level is exciting. And then um, when we had uh, Sean Boylan join the team as well, who who's obviously a friend of, of Connor's and and who I've worked with previously, it just added that extra dimension to it. Uh, and then we had Declan Morgan and Ronan McCart as well, two great down men on board with us so um that was one aspect of it and, and then the players as well um really athletic highly skilled group um that, that we just really wanted to utilize um those two aspects of the team and we were able to win ulster which which was the goal um when we sat down at the start of the year unfortunately um you know we we, we didn't push on Roscommon got us deservedly so in the night in Breathney park but look overall um it, it was a great campaign for us it's interesting when you talk about that assembly of characters and legends of the game in the backroom team. Did you know that this group of under 20s was particularly talented and that's why you said to yourself, right, OK, we need to, to make every effort under the sun possible to ensure that we give these kids the best possible chance of success? No, I, I don't think that was really a factor. I think um, once we decided that we were we were on board and all five of us in the management team um, are kind of all-in type characters. It wasn't going to be a, we'll see how we get on the first year. Um, Connor was particularly um, optimistic about the group we had. He He's very much involved with Kilku underage and followed them right through. But you know, I held my hands up and said to Connor, look, I don't know a lot of these guys, um, a lot of their clubs, I know individuals here and there. But we, we agreed that that was irrelevant. We wanted to do something slightly different, um, create really high training standards within the group. Um, test them physically and mentally and then go about kind of um, being really consistent in, in how we wanted to play and, and how we wanted to plan for the opposition etc so I think it, while it was great that the group did turn out to be um, capable of, of kind of maximizing what we wanted to do uh, we didn't go in saying oh we'll, we'll, we'll give this a go because it's a good group we mm-hmm. just kind of wanted to um, to, to kind of put it in place to to, um, to to kind of give down football a little bit of respect back that, that had been lost and and thankfully the, the management team and the players kind of gelled well and, and ultimately we got that Ulster title. What was Boylan's role in the whole thing? Uh, Sean was, was brilliant. Um, he, he just knows exactly what to do in any circumstance. If there was, you know, training sessions or, you know, we had six challenge games as well because there was no formal league. Um, you know, if, if things were maybe a little bit low key, he was able to come in with a motivational aspect. Um, if Connor or I were, you know, hyping, you know, a session up too much or, or being a little bit hard on the players, Sean would be able to calm it down. Um, he, obviously, look, he, he sees the game particularly well, um, reflects on it uh, as well. But just to have his presence there was very important for for the whole group and the commitment he showed was, you know, travelling from Meath. Um, it really just emphasize what we were doing was was just a, something that it was just so enjoyable that you didn't even think about the time and energy you were, you were spending on it so yeah like it was a pleasure to, to work side all all the guys but but sean and connor in particular so sean was basically telling you if you were going too hard on the kids it, it, to an extent you know he would be able to calm it down and say look um we we've we a few days to the game or um you know the this this is just maybe if there was too much pressure in a situation, you know, where, where young lads maybe are 
um, you know, you don't want to make them apprehensive. You want to make sure that they're serious about their preparation. And he was just brilliant in that respect. We're saying, look, you've done this before with your club, etc. Nothing mm. overly groundbreaking, but it was just the time and, and the way he delivered it. Um, I think we all learned a lot from it. It's really interesting looking at the identity of this year's All-Ireland finalists at senior level and seeing how much those Mayo under-21s and Tyrone under-21s have really come through that, I think is it 15 and 16 that they both won All-Ireland titles at under-21 level. Is your sense that that trend is going to continue even though under-21s is now under-20s? I think it will. Uh, I I do feel that uh, young kids that are playing the game at at the minute and you have to remember at that under-20, under-21 level, um, it's kind of the last time in their, I suppose, inter-county careers where they're given, they, they have the ability with other things generally going on in their lives where they can fully commit to football without the commitments of family, um, serious jobs, financial issues, things like this. And that's kind of reflected in the atmosphere at training and, and you know, h- how enthusiastic they are for every session because that's the main focus of their day. Um, I know it is at Inter County Senior, of course it is, but uh, the older you get, the the, the kind of, particularly within the GA, um, still be an amateur in terms of having to hold down jobs. It can be, it, it's, a, it's a brilliant age group and the very best guys, if they're in the right environment, such as the Mayo, um, I think, as you said, 2015 to around 2016, it's just then, it is a progression, maybe two years at their club, one or two might go straight up to the to the senior panel. And they just carry that through, that momentum. It adds energy and, and uh, quality to the senior squad that's already there in both counties. And um, I think now with how athletic these 20, 21, 22-year-olds are, um, you're going to see more and more of them playing quickly. So what is the number one thing for you if you zoom out and look at down football as a whole when it comes to this generation of footballer? What, what is the most important thing to ensure that they do transition well and effectively to senior level? Suppose it's pride in the in the jersey, um, what it means sort of to represent down, um, based a little bit on on the past, you know, the teams of the sixties and and the nineties, to be competitive in every game, in every training um, session that you attend, that it, it's it's a big deal, it's important. There's a chance to get better, um, because there's a number of counties in Ulster that are um, have been well ahead. You know, Down haven't won an Ulster title at senior level since 1994. So I suppose for me personally, um, I, th- that's the number one goal. But it doesn't just come overnight. It has to be a mindset for players within their clubs that it's every day. Um, every, of course, you need downtime and, and everyone wants to do that different ways. But every training session is it's 100 percent. It's flat out. There's a purpose. Um, uh, and, and that gets carried through to every single game because there has obviously been games at senior level where down haven't been competitive in, in recent years and uh, I know they've they've um, kept in Division 2 this year which is really, really important but in terms of the Ulster Championship um, there's been one or two finals here and there since 94 but never really looked like winning them. I'm sure from the playing group's perspective then as well having someone like you around is a great person to have just because you've shown that it's possible to be a boy wonder and absolutely live up to the hype. I know obviously you go to Australia, but you come back and even in your, your short time playing with the senior team for down, it did show that you did live up to the promise that you showed at underage level. And that promise was, was exceptional, Marty. Like just doing a bit of reading before today, is, is it true that you played minor and under 21 level in the same year? Yeah, I did. Yeah, 2005, I think that was. Were, were you starting for both teams that year? Uh, I did start for both teams um, in the in the latter stages. Down got to an All Ireland Under Twenty One final, lost to Galway, and in the minors we actually beat Mayo in the final in two thousand and five. So, so yeah, look, I, I suppose I hope I can have that that influence. For me, it was important um, in terms of you know you hear me talk about training standards, day to day standards. Um, I think for me, when I went across to Australia. I maybe wasn't the, the hardest trainer on the down teams or on the club teams. Um, I, I knew I had ability. I loved um, doing everything with the ball. Any spare minute I had. Um, gym probably wasn't really a thing for 18, 19 year olds back then. Uh, and any time I had was to focus on my, my skills, my left foot, kicking, free kicks, things like that. But when I got to Australia, I'm thinking that, you know, I was a fairly, um, you know, well-established, um, you know, quality player. 
you're put down to earth because you're you're bottom of the of the list of, of AFL talent that's there at Collingwood. So for me, I had to grind and graft every session to to show something to give a hundred percent. And eventually, then I was able to um, get into the the best team at Collingwood. And um, you, you just carry that with you. And then when I got back to down, um, it, it probably just carried through that you know every session is an opportunity. Um, every meal is an opportunity, uh, every recovery session. And I suppose um, th- there's obviously time and, and the off season's getting shorter um, for, for county players and, and club players. Um, the split season will probably be important because it, it is important to, to physically and mentally switch off from the game. But I do feel um, y- you need that level of training standard. You need that mindset of you know, how can I get better? How can, how can we as a team, as a county improve? I get the sense from what you're saying there, Marty, that you didn't necessarily feel that level of expectation that one might feel from being involved at under-21 level despite being literally underage for minor, being one of the, the best players of your generation, that it was just pure enjoyment in those early to mid-2000 years that you didn't really feel the weight of, of down on your shoulders. Because I guess nowadays, if there's a kid that comes along like that, there is a sense of, OK, come senior time, this guy's going to going to help our county get to the promised land. But it didn't seem that you were getting bogged down by that at all. No, I don't think so. Um, I, you have to take a, a lot of that things with with, um, with, with an element of, um, you know, there's always going to be headlines. There was no social media in those days either. Mm. Um, there was a lot of good players around me um, at, in both squads, under 21s, down minors. Um, and you, you just kind of focusing on that um, opponent every week and um, yeah look uh, uh, of course I'm delighted to have been able to entertain you know people of down and um, to, to give them have given them good memories and I know it was only for a short time as well but um, in terms of pressure weighing down on young players and things like that I think if you just if you do have that simple mindset of you know every session every game um, uh, you know, you, you you can improve, and you can kind of um, not let it, you know, take over your your mindset. Like, do you remember those very early years when people are starting to talk about you as somebody who could be an outstanding minor and an outstanding senior for your county? Like, I mean, there's these crazy stories of you scoring three goals and twenty points in a single under fourteen match, for example. I I, I presume there was a, a moment in your in your teens where you start to become aware of of the reputation that you had. Yeah, I think so. Um, even, like even back then, I think my school, St. Louis Kilkeel, um, we kind of climbed the, grant, the ranks from C grade in the Ulster colleges up to the McCrory uh, level, which is obviously elite in Ulster. And um, along the way, I think maybe it was in um, one of the the B grades, I'd scored one seventeen in a in a final as captain and. Uh, you, you do you do hear the noise around the school and then the county and and then maybe outside of that um, as well. But you know, how many were frees, brother... Marty? Is the is the question I have to ask here? Everybody's screaming at the radio right now. Sorry, what was that? Uh, how many of that was frees? Is is what people are probably asking. No, all from play. All from play. <laughs> as, far, as, as far as I can remember, but um, <laughs> but yeah, look, I I had my brother as well. John was was playing mm. for Down Seniors at an early age, and um, you you know as well that. That once you get to senior level, it is where you're going to be be tested. I remember playing from a club at 16, and you know that can be humbling as well because you're coming up against um, grown men who are intelligent, they're crafty in terms of how they're stopping you. Um, they're physically bigger, and it can be intimidating as well as a younger player. So you know if if you are dominating in your own age group, there's always going to be that challenge in Gaelic football because it's it's actually interesting um, when I explain to my teammates in Australia that the best players in Ireland go back and play at club level for, for their local teams and that can be at junior level um, or, or, or whatever it is and they just can't believe this or like surely these guys dominate like beyond recognition and, and I, I just explained to them that very often it's not the case because of the way they're targeted because of the way um, the, the game is played it, it can be hard some players represent their county I'm sure everyone knows guys within their own county where they actually play better in a county jersey than their club jersey, which sounds crazy, but um, it, it's kind of just the, the way it is um, in club level up and down the country. That Australian dressing room you mentioned then, that is sometimes the thing that a lot of people find really hard about going to Australia, not so much the dressing room, but maybe the way of life or just being so far away from home. You are one of these people who 
in the first stint worked out so well for when it comes to the professional game down there. You've mentioned the work ethic already, but when it came to the mental side of things, why did it go so well for you at the start in Australia? I was supported particularly well. Um, I think most kids that go across, um, that they, they enjoy the training, they enjoy getting up, going to, you know, if it's a gym session, if it's a pitch session, if it's a game, um, no matter if it's for the reserves or the first team, that side of the game is what we're there for. And getting paid for that is is highly motivational and, and everything else. It's the time away from the club, you know, those three, four days, maybe on a long weekend where um, your teammates are going, you know, back to their families and, uh, you know, you're there and yes, you're, it's a beautiful city with climate, but it's your time away from the club after a hard session, after a, a defeat, um, are you going home to an empty house or, or what is it? I lived with the family um, of a guy who worked at the club and I had brilliant support. I was kind of integrated with, with Australian society. My teammates were so good to me. There was development coaches there. So that network around me allowed me simply to focus on um, getting a game in the first team and staying in the team. And I, I, it was enjoyable um, my experience of, of kind of the day-to-day -day life, I was able to maximise that because I had so many good people around me who were kind of doing the difficult things for me, such as making, washing my clothes and making my dinner, things like this. Um, that, that might sound trivial, but um, it, it certainly can impact some lads that go out and, and they're living on their own for the first time over there. It's just mm. an extra challenge that, that's, that's a little too much. What I always find interesting, Marty, is your decision then to come home. Obviously, it worked out pretty well. Like the 2010 season is, like as you say, you've got to go back to the early 90s to find anything that can hold a candle to, to 2010 from down football's perspective. But when it comes to people who do a U-turn on the Australian career or maybe even just take a break from the Australian career, it, it tends to happen when things maybe haven't gone so well down there. And, and we've seen it in, in many a case. But you seem to be the exception to that where things were, were going well. And, and as you say there, you, you'd settled in well to Australia. So why was the pull to come home greater than the pull to keep you at home in the first place, if, if that makes any sense? Yeah, it does. Um, it, it was a particularly difficult decision because it was two very much positive options. Um, it, it was probably like a 55, 45 to come home. Right. Um, I, I was in a, a long-term relationship with my now wife. We have three kids, Anna. So that was back then, obviously, I didn't say that because it would have put a lot of pressure on. But thank, thankfully, it's worked out. And, you know, we're happily married, living in Newcastle here. Um, th that had a big influence. I was 22, 23 um, Anna was finishing her medical degree at the time, so we kind of needed to make a decision there. But outside of that, it was, you know, it, it was the, the draw of going home to, to play for Down. Um, you know, at, at the time, Ross Carr was manager uh, and Ross was kind of speaking to me. And um, unfortunately for him, it, it, he didn't end up staying in the job when I did come back. But um, it was kind of that draw of why, why they loved Australian rules. And it was a great career in terms of financially. Um, I, I wasn't the main player. I wasn't playing a role where I felt um, I was maximising my sporting ability. It was more mm. I was playing a defensive role at times. I, um, I I was often offloading the ball on to more skilled teammates. And, and that kind of, um, you know, didn't really sit well with me because I knew moving forward, I fully accepted that, you know, my kick in an AFL wasn't going to be as good as the top four, five, six players on the team. And, um I wanted to come home and, and, and try and dominate uh, in the GAA if I could and see where I could help the, the down team get to. Anna is Australian, I presume. Pardon? Uh, no, no, Anna's, Anna's Irish. Yeah. Sorry, Anna's, so she, she, you, you met her in Australia and then you moved back together, is it? That was that was the decision you had to make? Yeah, it, it was. Um, no, we uh, we were going out before I went across in 2006 right. and then any any of my off season I spent with her and she flew out in her holidays from university and things like that. So, um, and then she ended up coming back out across with me in, at the end of 2011. So, bit of a story there, but um, th thankfully that side of it all worked out. Yeah, or at least I say thankfully, Anna might say different. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, that was certainly a, a big factor, it seems, from from the whole thing. I didn't realise that. So that 
period then when you managed to, I guess, seamlessly slot back into to Gaelic football, to, to put it bluntly, that that season of 2010, I've probably already alluded to it as as a positive thing. I'm interested in, in your take on it, though. Is it a positive year in, in your mind? Somebody with that winning mentality, obviously it is defeat ultimately in the All-Ireland final. So is it a disappointing year overall or do you look at it in, in the greater scheme of things and say, well, what else have down, done over the last 25 years? I think if you look at the 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 longer it goes, the defeat to court hurts more and more. Um, that opportunity that was there, uh, it, it, that side of it is is never really going to leave um, any of that panel in, in 2010. But as you said, the overall big picture, the journey that we went on that year, how how um, positive that was for the county and the people within the county, even the under 20 squad. Um, that, that I was involved with this year. Those guys were 9, 10, 11 years of age back then. Um, so you know, that was a big thing in, in their passion for down growing up. So overall, it, it was a very happy year, a very positive year. Um, for, for myself, I look back with it you know, with fondness. It was great weather. Um, they were brilliant down jerseys, even if you see old photos and stuff. Um, got to play, play at Croke Park five or six times that season. Yeah, look, overall positive, but of course, um, especially with all our final coming round again now in a couple of weeks, it, it's it's difficult because you can never say you, you've won one and uh, we were we were close, you know. And your own perspective on that final? I mean, am I right in saying it was Noel O'Leary who who picked you up and maybe that that was a, a bit of a shock on the day for, from your perspective? Like, do you look back on that and say? God, I, I wish we'd some other plan other than the one to, to, to allow a man follow me around the, 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 the entire length and breadth of Croke Park for the entire afternoon. Yeah, and I think because it was a novel final as mm. well, um, we, like Mayo are now this season, we were playing in Division 2. Uh, we hadn't played Cork um, in the Championship since 94, I think. Um, and we, those matchups, they were very much, we were guessing. Um, O'Leary was a rampage in that year. Um, he he was a good footballer going forward as well. So didn't really see it coming, and, and that could be a factor with with Tyrone and Mayo. I, I know they they played um, in the league in October 2020 um, in a, in an important game. So maybe we get some clues to the matchup surge. But but in terms of our own matchups um, and the O'Leary one and, and Shields going to Benny Coulter, we probably didn't predict them. Uh, and uh, it, it, I, I suppose you could say those two boys got the better of Benny and myself uh, and, and that had a big factor in the game. What do you do in that situation? Because you're right, it's going to be a massive talking point in the build-up to the final because nobody really has any clue who's going to mark who and I think even in the context of last Saturday not a whole pile of people would have seen Conor Myler picking up Paddy Clifford and smothering him for the entire game. Probably one of the most successful matchups Toronto have ever picked. So what would you do if you were in Paddy Clifford's shoes on Saturday or if you had your time back in 2010 what would you do when you're in that situation? I think, firstly, um, just on the, the Tyrone Kerry game, I think the the six goal game that um, I think was in the middle of June. Um, can you imagine what Tyrone must have taken out of that in terms of learning for this game moving forward? Yes, of course, there was an element of you know that that psychological the revenge. This hurt us so much, but. To actually be able to see how Kerry scored six goals against them this season, what matchups worked, what matchups didn't work, where did the damage come from? The majority of those six goals, in fact, all of them came from central regions. And um, for whatever reason, Tyrone were particularly open that day. Kerry moved the ball extremely cleanly um, by foot and by hand and were clinical in front of goal. Um, I know the, the Niall Morgan lob one from a kick out, it was probably the, the outlier, but the other five were, were really well worked moves through the central challenge. So you can imagine then the the body of evidence that Tyrone had to to, to kind of work on to, to say, right, we need to block out this area and we need to change these matchups and we need um, X on Ganey. Clifford did this, this try Myler. It, it was such an advantage for Tyrone because they were brave enough and courageous enough to look at it in that light. You win or you learn. Um, and they learned so much from that. And I suppose to answer your, your initial question, what could Clifford have done? Could he have got more um, help from his teammates, a shoulder here and there? Um, it, it, could he have could he have ran? Try, you can't run Connor Myler because he's so fit. Mm. It probably needed to be a block from a teammate, a, a shoulder, um, 
something, something to, to try and get him into space or just pass him the ball, even if Myler's right on him, just give it to him. He'll make something happen. And potentially, you know, that's answering the same question about O'Leary and myself. But um, at, at the end of the day, those two guys won the matchups, Myler and O'Leary, and, and, and it was key on those particular days. So you basically need a teammate to come in and, and clean out your man for you? It, in, in a respect, yeah. Uh, certainly something they focus on in Australia. Um, if, right. if your best player is getting, getting tagged, um, it's, it's your duty to, to, to be physical on that opponent. There's more leeway in it in Australian rules. There's more stoppages. The physical contact is, is much more legal in that respect. But if you're, if you're um, Connor Myler being sent out to tag Cody Clifford and he, you've had a good start, um, the, the carry players are going to make sure that they're getting Clifford free um, and, and they're, they're doing that by physical means. Um, but, you know, it's, it's easier said than done. But, but do, do the best players in Gaelic get enough um, kind of protection at, at county and club level from, from their teammates if and when they need it? Obviously, the best players should be able to fight their own battles, but, but every now and then you, you need a teammate or two to, 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 to try and help you along the way. Yeah, absolutely. It seems that way. Um, Marty, we had you on the show, I think it was probably four years ago at this point. I think it was the, the summer of 2017. You were talking to, to Ger one of the nights and you were talking about a couple of tough years you'd had since around 2014 when you'd been diagnosed with Addison's disease. How has that been over the, the last little while for you as somebody who's had to give up high level sport as a result of it, uh, as, as a normal human being trying to go about each day? How has your life been? Yeah, it's been good. Thank you. Um, much probably in a much better position now um, in terms of my life. I think coming back from Australia, um, generally, you know, the Irish boys, the vast majority of us that, that that come home, come home not wanting to. My second time, that was certainly the case. Um, obviously, I got diagnosed with Addison's. I didn't get my contract renewed. That that's a difficult thing to deal with mentally. You've lost your career. Um, I didn't have a career path in mind immediately, like like many of the guys. And you do struggle to fit back into society um, in terms of, you know, you've, I was away for six years. I know I was home, home for that year and a bit, but um, kind of working out, what am I going to do? Um, will I go to university? Um, small day-to-day -day things like, you know, you've built up all your contacts in Australia. So if you need a plumber, if you need the car fixed, you know, you have to build up all these d different little um, mm. connections. It seems so simple, but it takes time and it probably took me four or five years to do so. And, and certainly now, um, you know, I think we're home six years. Um, it, it, it's it's a much, you know, easier way of life. The, the condition itself, I'm able to manage it with medication and, and things like that. So, you know, overall, I feel, feel definitely in a much better position now than, than maybe the last time we chatted. What is Addison's disease for, for people who don't know? Uh, it basically, it's a rare disease that affects the adrenal glands. So we, essentially the body doesn't produce cortisol. So, you know, the thing where in a big event in life or sport, whatever it is, you get that little injection every morning. And when you wake up, people who don't have Addison's disease, i.e. the majority of, of the population, get that release of um, cortisol. And there's a few other factors as well, but thankfully, we're, we're able to replace it. People with Addison's are able to replace it with um, hydrocortisone um, daily, and it, it doesn't really impact, um, you know, thankfully my life uh, too, too much. I know there are other people who, who maybe struggle a bit more with it, various um, different degrees of it, but thankfully for me, um, you know, it's, it's around fatigue and um, different things like that. And if you're on well, like colds and, and vomiting bugs and stuff, it, it, can, it can be quite, um, serious quite quickly, but thankfully I'm married to a doctor, so um, I'm a, a, <laughs> I can rest easy m most of the time. I presume that puts you on a bit more high alert when a global pandemic breaks out. <laughs> You'd think, yeah. Um, <laughs> but but generally um, we, we've been pretty good. Um, yeah. uh, certainly at the start there was a lot of unknown. Uh, I'm sure as there was for for everyone in the world. Um, but but thankfully, uh, I, I don't think it's it's kind of been too big a factor, um, or, or it's been, you know, too much more um, co complications um, related to, to the pandemic. That, that's good to hear. And, and like, has it? Like, the obvious one is it ends your sporting career. But in your day to day life, does it change what you can and can't do at all? I don't feel it does. Um, maybe that's just me. Um, you know, not 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 letting it. Um, I feel that I'm able to 
particularly with working from home and things like that now, I've been able to get back into the morns to, to run, to, um, you know, train. I did some of the sessions. Connor and I jump in with the under 20s from time to time. Um, and I was able, you're able to do that. So I, I feel that, that I'm quite fortunate in that respect that it hasn't really impacted me too much. Am I right in saying you were 29 when you got the diagnosis? I think it was maybe 26. 26. Right, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. As far as I know, it was 26. So you're fairly young and um, it generally affects kind of people maybe in that, you know, 50 years of age. Um, obviously, it can affect everyone. But um, it, look, it was a bit of a shock uh, at the time and things to, to accept and then it, it contributed to losing the career. But um, I, I've met a lot of people who, who have the condition or have children who have the condition and, and whatnot. And um, you know, it's just great to, to chat to them and tell them um, my, my story and, and that it's not the end of the world if there is a diagnosis there. And having been through that whole period now of, I guess, coming to terms with the fact that you wouldn't play competitive sport again and getting back into competitive sport as a coach with, with down under 20s, how do you reflect on that period, those days of being 26 and being told by a doctor that you really shouldn't be playing competitive sport anymore when you should be coming to your peak at that point? Yeah, that, that was a tough period for me because um, it probably took about four months for the diagnosis to, to come true, which anyone who's listening that, that, that has had anyone that's been diagnosed, that's a very quick diagnosis. Generally, it can take um, several months to, to, to years. So um, it, it really impacted my performances. Um, I was dropped to the reserves after the first game of the season in 2014. The harder I tried, the, the worse I felt, the, the more that was reflected on my output on the field. And um, you were getting heckled from the crowd saying, go back to Ireland. Um, the coaches and your the senior teammates were saying, because they knew like part of my game was work rate, but it literally looked, if you were looking at me, that you know I wasn't trying. Um, and obviously I'm saying, oh, I'm not feeling well, but you know, it, it, it's, it, it was really difficult for, for me. And, and when the diagnosis came as, as concerned as it was because it was a rare condition, I was relieved that it wasn't in my head because that was starting to filter in as well. Um, but the support I had from, from Anna and the doctor at Collingwood at the time, a guy called Peter Pequi, who did all the investigations, who who had the faith in me that this was something physical, even though it was so subtle what was going on with the with the blood and the different um, symptoms that, that, that presented. So look, overall, it, it, it was of course disappointing, but um, there's a lot more worse. There's a lot worse things it could have been, and and, and a good enough innings in the GA and AFL at the elite level to accept it. And is being involved with a pretty high level team this summer giving you that competitive drug once again? Is this like the first time you're starting to feel that going through your going through your blood at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it really did. Uh, I really enjoyed um, working alongside that that standard, you know, that standard of player. And even even when you get to train and you know that you're going to have a full squad, um, you know, there's not going to be you know, the excuses that sometimes can, can occur at a club level and, and different things. You know, you, you've got a group of players that have bought in and you're winning games and you're reviewing games and you're preparing for the opposition. It, it, look, it really was. It, was. it was a brilliant, we had brilliant weather as well and we trained um, because the centre of excellence isn't there and down. We trained in all different venues throughout the county and, you know, it was really, really enjoyable. And as you said, it was it was great to get back at that level in, in that capacity. And what sort of personality is Marty Clark on the sideline? Is he the, the cool, calm, calculated guy or is he the kicking every ball with his team sort of coach? I'm the latter, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but but I, uh, I had three years with a club um, in Down, St John's, uh, that my brother played for, based outside Castle Wellen. So I learned a lot on, uh, in that role. Um, I, uh, I I've learned to, 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 to calm down a, a little bit and, and try not to, to, to kick every ball as much. And um, certainly being in a backroom team rather than the main man for the under 20s, um, while maybe some some people are still saying I'm, I'm kicking every ball, I'm certainly trying to analyse a lot more and um, I think that in-game decision making is still the number one challenge in GAA um, as it is in, in most um, elite sports but uh, I, I think the preparation is great and you've, you've got your video and we plan to do this on kickouts so, but when things aren't going right or things are going well how do you change them? How do you get that across? That's mm. the biggest challenge and um, it, it's something that kind of 
you know, it took a lot out of working with Connor and Sean Boyle in this year. I can imagine. Uh, one last thing then, Marty, as, as somebody who's, I guess, been involved in a pretty incredible under-20 championship this summer where, I mean, down versus Roscommon is relatively novel on one side of the draw. Awfully winning the whole thing was extremely novel and they were brilliant scenes at the full-time whistle. We're seeing a senior football final uh, which we've never seen before in Mayo versus Tyrone. It does seem that we're right on the edge of the beginning of a really energetic, unknown sort of decade, perhaps, of Gaelic football. Is is that a way too optimistic outlook on just one year, or, or do you share that? I think we have to be optimistic. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, I, I think the Offaly journey, you know, we were desperate to to, to kind of get to Croke Park. Um, once once we had beaten Monaghan, we were desperate. To, to, we knew the prize um, Offaly and Croke Park. It would have been, um, you know, it, it, it was a huge prize. And unfortunately, we, we weren't able to get there because their journey, much like Russ Commons, was, was unexpected. And, you know, they, they, they certainly played a really entertaining brand. And it was a, like that freedom I mentioned that, that under 20s can have um, because, because of their ability to, to give everything in their lives to it. And, and certainly they deserve that title. Um, you know, the, the first ever time Mayo and Tyrone in a final as well. Um, you know, it's a long time since, since both teams have won it, obviously longer for Mayo as their fans will not need to remind it. But <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, I think, um, is Dublin's dominance um, going to disappear overnight? No, of course it's not. Um, they lost a game after extra time. Um, that, that, that they that they could have won and we would have been talking about them in the final. Um, Kerry will learn so much um, from that defeat as well. Uh, and then you, you have a number of other teams um, that, that that have been around and, and hopefully that will come again. So look, if, if this is the start of, of the decade of what we're going to see, uh, now may it continue. Absolutely, absolutely. Hopefully uh, a good few years ahead for Gaelic football. Uh, you've been listening to Marty Clark, by the way, for the last little while. He is, of course, involved with the down under 20s. He is an all-star, a former down footballer and a former AFL footballer with Collingwood. Marty, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Thanks so much. All the best now.